Now, Mark's Gospel, please, and uh, chapter number 7. And uh, I want to read, please, from verse number 24. Mark 7 and verse 24. And from thence he, the Lord Jesus, arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into a house and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. He could not be hid. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meat, it is not suitable, to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this saying, go your way, the devil has gone out of your daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil had gone out, and her daughter laid upon the bed. Let's just ask for God's help, shall we? Our Father, we do come into your presence again this afternoon with thanksgiving. We thank thee, our Father, for the amazing grace of the Lord Jesus that we read of here, an amazing grace, our Father, that uh, can and has touched many of our lives, and we pray, Father, that we might enjoy uh, just a touch of that grace uh, this afternoon. We thank thee for this time around the Word of God, and we pray, Father, that the same gracious Holy Spirit who gave these words, and the same Saviour, our Father, uh, who touched lives back in those days, uh, would our Father uh, this evening, this afternoon, uh, touch life here in Newcomnock. So be with us, we pray, Father, give us help, we ask, as we ask, Father, for that help in the name and for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. That last hymn, Amazing Grace, I think uh, fits particularly well with this section here in Mark chapter 7. And perhaps you could almost write above this little section that title uh, from that great uh, song of uh, Mr. Newton, Amazing Grace. Many of you know, of course, that that was written by a man who you would never imagine having written such a hymn. He was uh, a man who was a slave trader. He was involved in the most extreme forms of abuse and murder and rape. And uh, he finally found the saviour. And he became uh, not only a Christian, but he became a hymn writer and I believe as well a minister of the word of God. What a transformation. And that was a touch of that grace that he wrote about. And that, of course, is the amazing, behind the amazing grace of that hymn. Well, perhaps we can see God's amazing grace here ever before Mr. Newton wrote his hymn. And it's here in Mark chapter number seven. There's three little thoughts I want you to share with you from this section. You might read that section and, and maybe like myself, you think, well, what could we get out of a section like that? And if you read that section this afternoon and wonder that, just uh, uh, spare a thought for me as I, wrote, as I looked at it and wonder, well, what can I get out of that uh, for this afternoon? Uh, well, I wanted to share three things with you, please. And uh, maybe if you remember, these three simple thoughts from this section. I wanted to see three lessons, if you like. I wanted to see, first of all, a lesson in opportunity. And we, we want to notice that this woman just grasped the opportunity. It doesn't seem to have been an opportunity she had before, but she had it just for a moment in time. There was just that little junction, in a sense, between uh, the movements of the Lord Jesus, the path of the Lord Jesus, and her path in life. And uh, before that, she never knew anything about him. And after that, those paths crossed and they, they, they went in opposite directions. But just for a brief moment of time, her path and the path of the Lord Jesus intersected and she grasped the opportunity. So we want to think, first of all, about a lesson in opportunity. Second, a lesson in humility. Maybe you noticed that and you scratched your head a bit as you read it. If you're not so familiar with the background to Mark 7, you might be aware that uh, the Jewish people in those days, I don't know about today, but in those days they had very derogatory terms for those who were non-Jews, uh, just as they still do in the Middle East. The uh, Muslims will refer to us as kofirs, I believe, or unbelievers. And uh, here the Jews referred to us, non-Jews, as dogs. Very uncomplimentary indeed, you might say. Well, uh, the Lord Jesus uses that word. 
not so much to insult in any way, but to, to test her humility. And so we want to think, secondly, uh, about a lesson in humility. So a lesson in opportunity, a lesson in humility. And please, would you just notice there what they, this woman asks for? She, she's not asking for a three-course meal or even to come for food for thought at uh, 1 p.m. next week. Just, just a few crumbs from the table will do. Uh, and there's this lesson in the great ability of the Lord Jesus. Just a few crumbs from his table would be sufficient. Mind you, it's interesting, isn't it, to notice as you go back through the word of God, what God can do with a few crumbs. You know, uh, they say it's said in the Psalms that uh, the manna was angels' food. It was almost as if the crumbs had fallen from heaven, and that yeah, that was sufficient. That was sufficient to maintain about five million people for forty years through the wilderness. Amazing what God can do with crumbs. Uh, and as those uh, five thousand came, just a, a chapter or so uh, before we were reading uh, this afternoon, as, as, as five thousand came and, and just a few a few crumbs really, was, was all it was five little loaves or five rolls. It must have been rolls. It's loaves in the King James, but one boy going out with that for his back lunch must just have been rolls really. Five rolls and and two small fishes and and just with a few crumbs, the Lord Jesus Christ is able to feed at least five thousand. And then, well, just in case you you wonder if. If there's, if there's a limit to what the Saviour does, just for good measure, he'll throw in 12 extra baskets from the crumbs that are left over. Amazing what the Lord Jesus Christ can do with crumbs. You see, when, when we come to Mark chapter 7, it's not our big grasp. This is so important. It's not our big grasp of a small God that's important. It's our small grasp of a big God that's important. And just that little grasp in, in our own weakness, in our own inability, in the smallness of our faith, in the, in the littleness of our appreciation of Christ, just that tiny grasp, sometimes expressed in the Bible in just a few words. For example, remember me. Just a few words that can be expressed in that, that tiny grasp, like a woman stretching out her hand after 12 years of misery and anemia and failure and just touching the hem of the garment of the Lord Jesus. Just a tiny grasp. A tiny grasp of a great God achieves great things. Just give me a few crumbs, would you? That would do me. And you know what? It did do her. Just a few crumbs from the master's table in Mark 7. So let's think then about these three simple thoughts. A, a lesson in opportunity, a lesson in humility, and just a little lesson in the great ability of the Lord Jesus. You notice there in verse 24 that the Saviour, in a sense, strays from his usual path so to speak. Primarily, the Lord Jesus Christ, as you know, was, was born into the nation of Israel. He was Jewish by ethnicity, by origin, and most of his ministry is, is around that area of, of Judea, uh, what today some call Palestine. It's not really Palestine. That was the Romans that called it Palestine. It's been Israel for a long, long time, a long time longer than when it was Palestine. And not far from that disputed area of Gaza, just a slightly north of it, is where we are here in verse number 24, Tyre and Sidon. And that really was foreign territory in many ways for the Jews uh, in, in, many, uh, in, in their history, I'm afraid. Uh, Tyre and Sidon were places where Jews did battle and they would have attacked the nation of Israel. So not in the best of terms, it has to be said. And yet, just for a moment, the Lord Jesus Christ ministry just strays close to that that border verse 24 and from thence he arose and went to the borders of Tyre and Sidon just almost into a uh, foreign territory and entered into a house and would have no man know it but he could not be hid for a, for a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him here's a woman and she's going to grasp her opportunity by the way it's very interesting to see through the the new testament scriptures in particular People who don't have much opportunity and they don't have an opportunity for very long and they grasp it. I, I remember well a lady who came from Burnfoot many years ago. I think we must just have arrived and must have been about 20 years ago. And she came into the old hall, pre-renovation hall, I remember. And uh, she came in, she, she didn't look that well. And she came to the gospel meeting that day. And I, I remember her going away and she said something to me. Uh, she said she would be back. And she said, I've never heard so much about Jesus. That stuck in my head. I've never heard so much about Jesus at a church. And she went out and she fully intended to come back. And she never came back. Now, it wasn't because it was me that was preaching and she thought, I'll not come back and give that much. No, you know, she was in the hospital within a couple of days and she passed away. She just had that little moment of opportunity. Sadly, so many of us, 
We just have brief moments of opportunity to grasp Christ. And as you go through the the New Testament scriptures, you'll find that there are people who just have that briefest moment of of, of opportunity. There are people, and and the Lord Jesus Christ is moving through and out of Jericho, and and the blind man, Bartimaeus, hears about it. And he's just going to pass by, he's going to walk past Bartimaeus, and he's got that one, oh, I don't know, ten seconds of opportunity in a lifetime just to grasp the Lord Jesus. And he cries out, Jesus, thou son of David, have, have mercy upon me. Or, or there are, there, there's a couple of blind men and they hear of the Lord Jesus passing by or the Zacchaeus and he knows that the Lord Jesus is going to be passing by. You'll find that phrase quite often in, in the New Testament. The Lord Jesus is passing by. There he is. You know, just very quickly and he'll be gone. And Zacchaeus climbs a tree. just want a glimpse of him. And they grasp that opportunity. Or there's a man in John chapter number 9, blind as well actually, and the Lord Jesus is passing by. Just that brief moment of opportunity. But here's the important thing. They don't let it slip. They grasp it. Because tomorrow, too late. It would be too late for them. The Saviour would have gone. So often times in our life too, sometimes the opportunity goes and even the, the, the touch of the Spirit of God goes. But verse 24, there's a woman and she grasps that opportunity and she comes to the Lord Jesus and it's an opportunity that's brief and that's passing. The greatest example, of course, and the worst example of that is at the end of the life of our Lord Jesus. Luke chapter 23, you remember the two thieves on the cross. They have the briefest of opportunities. Life is ebbing from them. By the way, interesting, just as a complete off, off the subject, uh, or slightly off the subject, I was listening to somebody speaking uh, uh, outside uh, preaching. It was on the internet, and uh, uh, Ray Comfort, some of you know Ray Comfort, and he had a great question, you know, to religiously minded people. He was speaking to a religiously minded person, and he asked him this question. He said, I've got a knife in my back. I've got three minutes to live. Uh, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that God is going to judge me. I've got a guilty conscience and I'm about to pass into the presence of God. What can you do for me? Oh, that's a good way of putting it. What can you do for me? You see, the only, the only person that could save someone just with moments of life left with a guilty conscience, broken laws, a blasphemer, an adulterer, somebody that had had a lustful look, somebody that had stolen, somebody that had anger in their heart, someone who was about to meet an angry God, a God of judgment. The only person that could save them was Christ. No religion could ever save them. And Christ, in a sense, is passing by here in Mark chapter number 7. And, and the only person that's going to be able to save them is Christ. Never mind your religion, dream, I'm not fucking help me. <coughs> so she grasps the opportunity, a lesson and opportunity. A lesson and opportunity. Um, it's interesting as well, you know, not to maybe split hairs or, or to, well, there's nothing wrong with looking at the details of Scripture, but you do notice that this woman, and this woman comes to the Lord Jesus on behalf of somebody else. It's interesting, isn't it? Here's a woman, and, and she comes to the Lord Jesus on behalf of her daughter. For a, verse 25, it's there in Mark 7. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him and came and fell at his feet. It's interesting, that. Right? This woman coming on behalf of her daughter. Somebody said to me a little while ago, um, you know, sometimes I hear preachers speaking about eternal life. He said, but you know, sometimes you get into a state in your life and you don't want any more life. You've had enough. Interesting. I've never ever heard that before. It's sometimes he says that appeal to eternal life. He said, that's not appealing at all. It's, it's because... Sometimes you just feel that giving up. Of course, they didn't really understand what eternal life was. Eternal life doesn't just mean the life that you've got and just keep on going forever. It's a different kind of life. <laughs> Come that you might have life in all of its fullness, yeah? It's a different kind of life. It's not a life that's burdened with sin and brokenness and emptiness, sorrow and sadness and death and tears. Go to the end of the book of Revelation, you'll find all of those things have gone. It's a different kind of life. You won't need your ibuprofens. You won't need your beta blockers. You won't need your blood pressure treatments and your diabetics. You can eat whatever you like there as well. <laughs> you'll be all right, yeah? It's a different kind of life. You won't have the problems and the financial worries. You won't have that. They've gone. You won't have to work for your living either. You won't be taxed. <laughs> yeah, all of these things will have gone. Different kind of world. So don't think eternal life means the same as you've got, but just more of it. No, 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 no. 
But you know, sometimes we do get into a state, don't we? And we kind of give up hope. And maybe, and what my friend was saying is that really, first of all, that you don't really want more of the same. And, 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 and sometimes you wonder if, are you really worth the effort? Could God, is God really interested? I mean, am I really worth saving? And isn't it interesting that we have here a woman, a mother, and she looks at the plight that her daughter's in, and she recognises where her daughter is. Maybe in a, in a sense, that, uh, something that her daughter doesn't recognise. She recognises that her daughter is sunk deep under the power of Satan, that her battles aren't just physical and material battles. Her battles are spiritual battles, a bit like the battles that we all face. Do you know the description, the diagnosis that the Apostle Paul makes of humanity in its entirety? It's found in Ephesians chapter number 2, and it's pretty bleak, let me tell you. Uh, the Lord... The, or the Lord speaking through the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2 says, And you, he's speaking to Christians at the beginning, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, he's quickened, he's made alive, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. You were part of this world system. According to the prince of the power of the air, you were part of this world system and over this world system is Satan, uh, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our way of life in times past and the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. You were broken, you were ruined and you were wrecked. You were part of the world system. You were fulfilling your own desires and your own lusts and Satan was over it all that was your condition and here's a mother and she looks at her daughter in Mark chapter 7 she sees that she's under the power of Satan uh, she sees where that girl is and secondly this is so important she sees a girl she sees a life worth saving you know, my, so my friend was saying that I've got a life and you know what I don't think it's worth saving and here's a woman and she sees her daughter and this daughter means everything to her, and she sees a life worth saving. Do you know what? Something even better than that. The Saviour sees a life worth saving. Isn't that great? <laughs> the Saviour. You, you know, sometimes we look at the pictures the Bible paints of the bleakness of humanity, and that's because the Bible tells us the truth. It doesn't sugarcoat it. I, I like that. It doesn't sugarcoat it. Somebody phoned me up the other week, and they wanted to go through what the hospital said to them about something and the woman said and I've often fallen out with her actually but she said to me she says I know I know that you'll tell me the truth she says. <laughs> and that's what we fell out with over the years you know I told her the truth didn't sugarcoat it she says I know you'll tell me the truth the, the bible tells us the truth we might not like it dead in trespasses and sins Broken laws, broken con c command, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Under the power of Satan in this world system, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. We're broken and we're dead and we're lost. And we might look at that description the Bible gives us, those descriptions the Bible gives us, and say, well, oh, forget it. <laughs> God isn't interested. Not yet. That's exactly the opposite conclusion to draw. That's where we are. And yet, despite where we are, we have a God who sees a life worth saving. A life that's so worth saving that God loved this world so much that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He sees, that he sees a life worth saving, so worth saving, that he took his Son and had him nailed to the cross at Calvary, and Christ suffered on the cross for my sins and died in my place and entered into my grave. That's how much of a life he saw worth saving. And the step of faith it is that he calls us to, to come into the benefit and the blessing and the joy of that salvation. And that's her second point here. She's a lesson in opportunity. And look at a lesson in humility. Verse number 25. There's really a double humility. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit. And heard of him and, and came and fell at his feet. There's a sense of humility about that isn't there? And then the Lord Jesus. I, I would suggest you test her, her humility. Verse 27. And Jesus said to her, let the children first be filled, for it's not meat to take the children's bread. It's not suitable to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. And he's really using that title that the Jews would use of, of non-Jews, dogs. And that's not used in a complimentary sense in any way in, in the Gospels. But you know, she's going to take a humble place. That's important. I don't know what you think of the Lord Jesus. Somebody told me the other day that he's my friend. Well, that, that's good. That's good. 
I don't know what you think of him. Maybe you think of him as, as, as a great teacher or as a help and, or as a comforter. And, and, and he is described in those ways in the Bible. That's all true. But first and foremost, so far as you and I as sinners are concerned, he's our saviour. And ever before he can be our friend or our help, he has to be our saviour. He must be our saviour. And if he's not our saviour, then he can never be our friend. Because if he's not our saviour, we are enemies of God. Therefore, he's not our friend. If he's not our saviour, he cannot indwell us and, 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 and come into us. That John, John's gospel speaks about that in chapter 14. If he's not our friend, he can never be our comforter and our help. He must, first of all, be our saviour. And to be our, our saviour, we must come to him in humility and see that we're sinners and that we need a saviour. And that we need the one that was crucified on the cross, not only because we need a help and, and we need a friend and we need a comforter and we need all of those things, but first and, all, first and foremost, I need my sins forgiven. First of all, I, I need a saviour who loved me and died for me. And so she comes in humility. Not that not, not, not the, the Jesus of the Bible is her equal, though. The Jesus of the Bible is the God of heaven who's going to die on the cross for her sins. He's the only one who's got power over Satan. He's supreme. Sovereign. I don't know what you think of Jesus. But unless we've ever come to him in humility and taken him and trusted him as our saviour that died on the cross for our sins, then we can never know him as anything other than than the Son of God who one day will judge us. Which is what he does with the devil here. Tremendous lesson in opportunity, a tremendous lesson in humility, that step of, of humble humility and faith. And thirdly, look at that lesson there of ability. Ability. And she answered, verse 28, and she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. For this saying, go your way, the devil has gone out of, the do of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out and her daughter laid upon the bed. The dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. Hmm. Sometimes people have a misunderstanding of the of God and, and of the Bible and, and of the message of the gospel. Uh, and sometimes that misunderstanding goes along the lines of, I want to be a Christian and I'm going to try really hard to get a grasp of that great God out there. Uh, I, I understand that he is a great God. He's the creator God of the universe and so he is. And he's a God who gave us those commandments that, all of those things that he expects of me, that high standard that he, he must be holy therefore, he's a great God. And I want to be a Christian, so I'm going to try really hard today to, to be like that great God or to reach that great God or to please that great God. Listen, to be a Christian, to be saved and ready for heaven, isn't about your great grasp of that God or, or, or my great ability to reach that great God. It's about a great God and just just taking the little crumb, just that tiny little grasp that I can have. It's about my tiny little grasp of a great God. And so sometimes, you know, especially in the Christian life, we, we stumble and, and, and maybe at times we fall and, and we wonder, as, oh, where are we going? And, 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 and I'm ever going to get there. Let me just give you this word of assurance. It's not about your big grasp of a small God. It's about your tiny grasp of a great God. That's what took the thief into heaven. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. It was because of the cross of Calvary something was being done that that thief could never do. In fact, I don't think he even understood what was going on at Calvary. He, it, it, something was happening at Calvary that Christ, who knew no sin, Here's something amazing. The, 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 the Bible teachers call it the great exchange. He who knew no sin, the Lord Jesus, was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, that God would take his son and punish him for my sin. That we have this God of amazing grace, this God that looks down upon me as a sinner and says, yes, Stuart, you are a sinner and you deserve hell and judgment, but I'm going to take that judgment and I'm going to place it upon my son. 
at Calvary. I'm sure that thief could hardly conceptualise any of that. All he knew is he was desperate. He needed a saviour. He was going to meet God. And here was someone that they said was a saviour. Yeah. Remember me. It's a great, it's a, we have a great God. We have a God that has given us the life that we've got. And that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Pretty amazing. Just imagine, we've often said, line this hall with bookshelves, just about a foot high, and put all of the books and all of those bookshelves, I think it works out about 100,000 books, and all of that information is in one of your cells. Yeah, just one of your cells. And you've got a few billion of those. Yeah. If I was to take Billy, put him in a liquidizer, stretch his DNA from earth to heaven and back, it would go to the sun and back a thousand times. He's smarter than you look. <laughs> full of information, jam-packed full of libraries of information. We have a great God, God of infinite power and wisdom. But more than that, we have a God who's inspired the word of God that laid out prophecies, a God who's in control of history. And we have a God who has come up but with and, and fulfilled a plan of, of eternal salvation that those that come and trust in his Son are given the gift I give unto my sheep, eternal life. He takes us, uh, individuals that are brief and passing and fleeting and, and, and doomed to die, and he takes us and he saves us and he cleanses us and he fits us for the purity and holiness of heaven and he gives us eternal life. We've got a great God. I'm not asking you to replicate any of that, just to get a tiny grasp of it. Lord, how about just a few crumbs, you know? Would you spare a few crumbs for me? That would do me. Well, she was right. Just like the thief on the cross, Lord, remember me. Or the woman that stretched out her hand just to touch the hem of her garment. Or Lazarus in the grave who heard just a couple of words, Lazarus, come forth or that little girl the, the daughter of Jairus who was lying in the bed dead and she heard in her spirit she heard those words Talithai kumai little one arise just a few words just a touch just a glimpse just a resting of faith in Christ we've got a great God how about a few crumbs would that do us that would do me just to rest in such a saviour and that secures for me eternal life, eternal salvation, just a few crumbs. Let's pray. Our Father, we do give thanks for thy word. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus. We thank thee, our Father, for one who looks upon us as lost and sinners and yet sees us so worth saving. We thank thee for the amazing grace of our God. And we thank thee, our Father, for the greatness and the glory of our God. We thank thee, our Father, for, for a God who, for us, it's sufficient just to, just, just to have a, a touch of the hem of the garment, just to have a glimpse of the passing Christ, just to have a few words of a cry, remember me, just to hear a voice, just, just, just a few crumbs. For we've got a great God, a great salvation. And we know, Father, that the word of God doesn't call us to replicate thee. It doesn't call us to, 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 to do our best and work our hardest and, and try to make up our own way of salvation, but just to rest in the infinite and amazing grace of our God. We thank thee, our Father, for that. Bless the word of God to our hearts and courage our uh, life for thee and we pray father that if there's any here this afternoon that doesn't know thee as lord and savior that today just like that woman from Tyre, that we might come to christ in the fleeting passing moments of our life as that opportunity is there and rest in thee and trust the great savior we offer thanks our father 